It's Typewriter Tuesday. Let's journey into the past to see what writers of old used to use to ply their trade. What kind of mechanical beauty does Al have for us this week? Hi, this is Al Gansky, and welcome again to another Typewriter Tuesday episode. And we have what I think is a fascinating little piece of typewriter history, uh, and it's called the Royal Safari. As you can tell, of course, it is a portable, and it is fairly recent, 1980, which is uh, fairly recent for typewriters, especially manual typewriters. Um, you could get some as late as the 1990s and the like, but there just weren't as many. And the era of the typewriter, especially the manual typewriter, was fading very quickly. You can see it's called a Royal, a Royal Safari. Uh, Royal made other safaris. To be technical, I should tell you this is really a Royal Safari 2, or sometimes called a Model 2. If you try to do any research on it, you'll need that. Even though the number 2 or uh, Roman numeral 2 doesn't appear anywhere on it, uh, it is generally referred to as uh, the Royal Safari Model 2. And it was not made in New York by the Royal Company. A company in Portugal had obtained the rights to make typewriters under various brand names, including Royal, as well as Imperial, Sears, uh, Cold Steel, ABC, and others. And they began to produce these. Now, as you would expect from a typewriter in the 80s, it is mostly plastic. It's plastic on the top, it's plastic on the sides, very durable plastic. And uh, I don't mean to degrade it by saying that it's plastic. Sometimes plastic is better. Typewriter's a little lighter. The color goes all the way through the plastic, so if you get a scratch, it's still uh, the same color as the surface. So there's some things to commend it, but it also, uh, and you can pretty much bet money on this, is that the interior workings, which we will look at in just a little bit, uh, is going to be a bit cheaper. The metal is lighter, thinner gauge, uh, and other things. So they're not quite as durable mechanically as those from uh, decades before, which uh, even if you buy a, a typewriter now that's 60, 70 years old, it will probably outlive every machine that you have and probably outlive you too and still be rather usable. Let me give you a quick tour of it. Plastic keys, nicely spaced, uh, which makes it fairly easy to type on, very easy to read. Uh, when you're looking for the letters, you can see the number one key in the uh, upper row left, uh, the upper bank, I should say. It's got the exclamation mark. It's really got a full set of keys, including this lovely little red tab key on the right side. Now, I bring this up to you uh, because uh, a lot of type portable typewriters didn't have tabs. This one does. Here's the downside. You can't set them. There's no place to set the tabs. They're preset, so Whatever the factory thought people wanted, that's how they set the tabs. And unfortunately, I think they made some bad choices. The first tab is much too deep into the paragraph than what we normally would expect. Um, you know, we, when I was a kid, we were taught you space five spaces in uh, for your tab, and that's usually where you set them. And it's pretty much the same thing now, even on computers. It's the equivalent of about five spaces. Well, this one's something like double that. Um, so it never quite looked right uh, to me. It has the basic adjustments on it. You can change the bichrome ribbon. In this case, this was busted. Uh, and I'll point that out again when we look at the inner parts, when the typewriter goes topless here in a little bit. Uh, and then, of course, you can adjust the tension. Uh, the action on it's very good, and it has a shorter play. We'll see that again in um, a shorter action uh, when uh, we look at it with the, its top off. The return lever that you see here is kind of interesting sticks way out, but it's meant to fit into a case. The typewriter comes with a case, a clamshell case, it flips over, locks into the bottom, two buttons in the front, you peel the thing off, same color uh, as this. Uh, again, this, there's other typewriters that look identical to this with different names. There's an Imperial that is almost identical. That would have been done in the United Kingdom, sold for the United Kingdom. Um, when you release this, that pops out and you're ready to go. Now, as I said, it was made in Portugal, and so it has a few odd little things uh, when you have stuff made in a country with a different language. And uh, I'll show this to you again in a, another view, but right here, it tells us to move a particular lever, which I'll show you in just a second. It says, before start typing, please move lever, carriage lock lever down. 
So the good news is it has a carriage-like lever, and that's this little thing right here. Um, and you push this up, it becomes uh, locked, and the carriage won't move once you get it into the locked position. The carriage no longer moves, and that's to keep it from shifting uh, while you're traveling. It's a safety measure for the typewriter. It's a good thing to have. You push it down, and then it's free again uh, for you to use. On the very back of this, it says made in Portugal. We'll get a closer look at that in a little bit, but made in Portugal. It's also part of the plastic in here. Very difficult to see in this particular shot. Again, I'll show you a closer one, but right here, there are raised letters that say made in Portugal. It has everything that you need in a regular typewriter. Uh, it has a way of moving the carriage. And an interesting thing about this is this is curved. Let's see if we can show that here. And you hook your finger into it. Same thing here. When you want to release the pressure rollers to free it up, you pull that in, push it back, locks it in. Paper bail, very thin metal, very insubstantial. So it, that's a bit worrisome for me, uh, especially regular typers get to where they slam these things around. But very easy to move does have a paper support above the paper table, but it's also very simple to use uh, and very lightweight. It uh, just simply pulls up and pushes down. 10 characters per inch. Uh, and here's the surprise. It types pretty good. Uh, it's, it kind of amazes me uh, how well that it types. Uh, but we'll stop now for just a second. And the shift over, I'm going to take this lid off, which is a very difficult thing to take off, and uh, use a little different camera here to show you the innards of this and uh, how some of those things work. So let's jump over and do that right now. Well, here's our Safari with its top off, so to speak. And we're doing this to show you a few uh, interesting things. Uh, sometimes you get a better feel for a typewriter uh, when you can look down into its innards, as uh, we're doing now. Uh, as mentioned uh, earlier, when we started this, uh, the typewriter itself is, the body is plastic and there is, uh, of course, metal throughout, but it's not the kind that you'd get from uh, much earlier typewriters from decades before. Uh, some of it is rather flimsy, light gauge, but nonetheless, it does still seem to work out. As you can see, the keys are very nice. We have a number one key with the exclamation mark, always nice. Nice uh, uh, margin release key. Uh, the shift key uh, and the shift lock key on the left side. There's a shift key on the right side, but no lock. And in the place of where the lock would normally be, you see a nice bright red tab key. And of course you have uh, on the right side a backspace key, uh, which is almost essential in all kinds of uh, typing. Uh, to this uh, edge over here, this uh, changes the ribbon color, uh, and this was a bit of a problem uh, for me here because some of the construction is not as robust as you get in some of the uh, older typewriters. This uh, disconnects very easily, and it's difficult to get it to connect again so that the ribbon color, which, uh, and this does take the bichrome ribbon, uh, uh, is, can be changed. And that works well once you have it connected right. But for some reason, this was off a little bit and had to do a little tinkering with it, which is unusual because for the most part, this is very, very clean. You can still see a spot or two here, um, but the inside quite clean, a little buildup of um, grease down there for one of the mechanisms that shifts inside. Uh, and same thing on this side, you can see a little bit of that. Touch of that's been cleaned up. One of the mysteries for me, if you look at those two screws there next to the uh, right side of the ribbon spool, it looks like there's a bit of rust on them. Well, the only reason I bring that up is there's none on this side. And as to whether or not the, the screws have been changed or part of this has been exposed to some moisture uh, that other parts of the typewriter haven't been, is really just hard to say, but it is kind of interesting. If we get over here and look down into uh, the inside of this you see a screw that also has some rust on it on the right side and then over here the same thing so while some of these are free of that 
there are a few screws that seem to be getting a bit of corrosion on them. The holes in the side here are where the lid locks in and boy does it lock in. It is a pill to take off. Um, it took me quite a while the first time to get the thing off because I was afraid I was going to break it. Uh, turns out it, I didn't need to be as gentle as I was being but it, uh, it worked quite well. It also seems that there is perhaps a uh, bit of trauma to the typewriter. If we look down inside you see that screw very close to the bottom of the frame here and look at the plastic and you'll see that some of that plastic has broken off. So I don't know if this was dropped uh, or what. If we look over here you see the same thing uh, that that bottom portion of the screw uh, clamps down upon is also broken. Uh, for something that is as clean inside and for the longest time I was thinking that this typewriter perhaps had been very lightly used um, because there's not the usual streaking on the uh, the platen which comes from a lot of use you can see because with a uh, typeface the type slugs keep slamming into that rubber it will create little grooves in it over time if the typewriter has been heavily used well this doesn't have that um, so I'm assuming it's been lightly used you can see here on the left side of the carriage uh, a couple of interesting things this little device right here a little easier to see this way is where the return arm locks in for use when you put the cover on the top and it has a clamshell type cover uh, of uh, brown plastic that matches the, the hood on the thing and then of course you just uh, simply lift up on this and it pops back out has a very wide angle on it like it's waving at you and then we come back around to the other side and you see an interesting little thing here just above the label it says to move this lever down. This lever here unlocks the carriage so that the carriage can be moved uh, or locked into place for travel. So if I move the shift in we can come back and look at this and you see the rail upon which the uh, carriage rides upon and this uh, is important in this type of typewriter because it's all typewriters that have the shift mechanism and that's virtually all of them that you'll encounter, uh, the designers had to make a choice. And the choice is when you hit the shift key, what happens up top? So when you shift this, something's going to happen either to the carriage, in this case, see how the carriage rocks, or the type basket. Now normally um, in a typewriter when you push the shift key, the whole carriage goes up and down and then some other models, especially later in typewriter history, as you get more and more towards modern times, the carriage drops. So now in this case, sometimes called a segment shift, will drop down. And the idea was that was to make it a whole bunch easier for you when you use your little finger to shift. Instead of lifting the whole carriage up, uh, you use gravity and you, when you push down on that, the carriage drops and then springs bring it back up. Well, in this case, you can see that this carriage rocks back and forth. So it doesn't really lift, it just kind of levers uh, the front end of the carriage up so that the type slug, that is the type face where the font is, um, will strike the platen in a slightly different place, allowing it to either be an uppercase or a lowercase uh, imprint on that. You can see uh, inside, you can see where the margin settings are, very easy to use. Now the other thing I wanted to show you and one reason I wanted to do this sort of topless version of the typewriter is down here you see these adjustment screws. Uh, when I first typed on this I couldn't help but notice that the alignment was off and by that I mean that the capital letters like say a capital H seemed much higher than the lowercase letters. In fact you couldn't see the full capital letter so I had to do some adjustments and there's a pair of these on either side uh, and one adjusts how high uh, the caps are, or how low the lowercase are. Uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, this was made in uh, Portugal. You get a little warning here to move that lever down so you, before you start typing. The truth is you really can't type until you do that, otherwise the carriage won't move. Uh, around the back side, you see again another place where it tells us that it was made in uh, Portugal, I believe right outside of uh, uh, Lisbon. 
And these were, again, marketed and branded under different names, Imperial, uh, Royal, and uh, some others, depending where they were going to be sold. Uh, they ha uh, the company had the licenses and the tooling and uh, allowed to do that. Well, um, that's it for the inside look of this Royal Safari 2, really a Mesa typewriter. And uh, we'll just put the lid back on and uh, go from there. Okay, and we're back. Let me just put a little paper in here. It types quite well. As I said, it's uh, 10 characters per inch. For a typewriter of uh, more recent age, uh, but nonetheless a late model, uh, it types better than I expected, especially for something I paid all of $29 for. It's uh, probably not been used a lot because it doesn't feel like it's broken in, but there, as we saw, there were a few things that made me think that it had been uh, dropped or shifted or somehow caused a little bit of damage inside to have messed uh, this up and required that I fix it, as well as mess up the alignment um, that I had to work on. And I showed you those places, uh, the two sides of underneath the carriage, where you can set the alignment so that the bottom of the H is at the bottom of the lower case, that is the bottom of the capital H is at the bottom of the, the lower case H or whatever letter that we're dealing with here. And it requires that you adjust both sides uh, to get that alignment just right. So as I said, it does type quite well. The usual phrase, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog, stupid dog. And it does, does quite well. A little unbalanced uh, in some areas. It's going to be difficult for you to see that. Let's see if I can pull that up so you can see it. Uh, and as with every typewriter, you have to learn to use it because every typewriter is different. And as we try to move in a little bit closer here, you can see that it types quite well. Uh, some of my typing is uneven. Uh, we've been spoiled using computers because, or even as early as electric typewriters, where the strike is always the same. And using a manual typewriter, sometimes your index fingers strike the keys harder than your little fingers, and so the imprint, the darkness of each letter will vary um, from uh, strike to strike, from every uh, type letter to type letter. Uh, it has one kind of interesting thing, puzzle me for just a second, I forgot that some typewriters do this, but if you look there's no button on the side, no button on the side, can't pull these out, so it, for a moment I thought there's no way to release the platen from the ratcheting system, but there is. Uh, you go to the line spacing, which it has a zero, a one, a uh, one and a half, and a two. And when you push it all the way back to the zero, then this will roll freely. And you can bring it up to the one. And you can see the, the numbers will be over here on this. And you bring it up to the one or the one and a half to do the typing. And you are good to go. Uh, it is a Royal in name even though a different company uh, manufactured it. Uh, it. It would seem like it might be one of the cheap new models, but I am pleasantly surprised at how well it types. It needs to be broken in a little bit more. Some downsides, of course, is the preset tabs, which I don't think any real typist cares uh, about having. They really like to set their own tabs, especially if you're having to fill out the same forms over and over again. You want certain tabs in certain places. Uh, so. Uh, there it is. It is a lovely little one. I like the two-tone colors. Uh, I love contrast, and this certainly has it, uh, between the light uh, base, the light, light body, and then the dark hood on it. Uh, and then uh, everything is just easy to read, easy to use, easy to lock up, easy to carry. So it really does have a lot to commend it, um, even though it lacks some of the robust engineering that uh, many earlier typewriters had. Well, thank you once again. I'm Alton Gansky. This is Typewriter Tuesday. And until next Tuesday, uh, keep typing.